hello. Welcome to your online lecture for high voltage pulse stimulation. Uh, so far we've covered IFC, pre-mod, and TENS. And today we're going to be talking about high voltage pulse stimulation. Uh, before I started teaching this class, I typically utilize IFC pre-mod probably all the time in my clinical practice. Um, and it wasn't until I started teaching this class and I had to actually teach you guys about the different types of electrical stimulations that were out there that I learned about high voltage pulse stimulation. And it has become one of my favorite modalities in the clinical setting, um, depending on what my physiological goal is for that particular patient. So we're going to talk about this modality. Um, do note that it is the first modality that we'll talk about that is monophasic in nature. So that gets me excited, you guys. So our first stop is really just to talk about its waveform. What we know about high voltage pulse stimulation is that it is a series of what are called twin peaked uh, waves, right? Uh, and so the twin peak means their, their amplitude is the same, right? That peak and the other peak, they're both the same. So twin peak monophasic waveforms. And so then what do I mean by monophasic? You guys probably could all tell me now, right? It's going to stay on one side of the isoelectric line. Either it's going to stay on the positive side or it's going to stay on the negative side, right? Most often Often you really don't alternate between the two. So again, monophasic, meaning it's staying on one side of the isoelectric line. And this is a great thing because it allows us to determine the polarity of treatment. And so we're going to talk about why that is important when we're thinking about physiological changes soon. But for now, keep that in mind. What we also know about high voltage um, is that it is capable, the device is capable of delivering up to 500 volts, right? So we can look there, we could go, oh my goodness, that's a lot of, of voltage to be delivering to a patient. The great thing about high voltage uh, pulse stimulation, and the key word is pulsed, um, is that the electrical stimulation that's being delivered to that patient is going to be pulsed. And we'll talk about that on another side so you can actually see it visibly. But in terms of its name, high voltage, it's capable of delivering up to 500 volts. It will not do that. And we'll talk about why, because there's something in the device that negates that. Um, and then it's twin peaked and, and monophasic. So you will need to know that for the board of certification examination. Okay, so as we progress, uh, we know that high volt has can get up to a relatively high amplitude, right? We said that about 500 volts, give or take. Um, so this is the first device that we're talking about that is capable of delivering um, greater than 100 to 150 volts um, during the electrical treatment, right? The other thing that we know is that they, we have these high twin peaked um, waves, but there's a low average current. Um, and so we're going to talk about that on the next slide. So hang with me there. High peak, but we have a low average current. And we'll talk about why the, low, the average current reduces, okay? One of the great things about having a twin amplitude a monophasic wave is that because we have these higher, this higher amplitude being driven, remember we get less tissue uh, capacitance or resistance, right? And so as a result, the electricity is allowed to overcome all of that resistance and travel deeper, right? So again, we get another modality that's capable of traveling deeper and exerting physiological responses to the deeper target tissues. And that's a good thing, right? Okay. So a lot of what I was talking about on that previous slide is we have these high, these high amplitudes, right? These high amplitude waves. But the cool thing about high volt is in that pulsed part, right? High voltage pulsed. So when we look at high, um, high volt, one of the things that we look at is, okay, we have these twin peaked monophasic waves, but they're not consistently on. In other words, we have a period of time where, guess what? The electricity is off, right? So we have that, what we call pulse period, where, where what? The device is off, right? Similar to therapeutic ultrasound, right? And um, pulse therapeutic ultrasound. Now we don't know when that off time happens, but we do know that it actually happens. So you have the twin peak monophasic wave being delivered to the patient. And then there's a very short, we're talking very short time that it's off, but it's this off time that reduces the total average current over time, right? So we're really not truly delivering 500 amplitudes because, or 500 volts, because the reality is there's a period of time where that high voltage is off. And it's what allows our patients to tolerate 
such a high volt electrical stimulation being delivered to them over time, right? Does that make sense, guys? I hope so. If not, you can email me and we can talk through this or when we're in class together, we can talk through it as well. So what are some of the advantages of high volt when we compare it to IFC or pre-mod or TENS? One of the great things um, about most high volt devices, um, and I can't remember if our high volt device does this, but you can um, manipulate the phase duration, which is something we could also do in TENS. We can manipulate the, the phase duration. Now remember, phase duration helps us determine which nerves are going to be depolarized, right? So we can certainly manipulate the, the phase duration on most devices. And if we can't, then we know that the phase duration is, is preset. Uh, what we also know about this, um, about high volt, is that it minimizes the simulation of our pain fibers. In other words, it's not going to cause uh, the simulation of our A deltas and our C fibers. So this happens to be what we would call a more comfortable form of stimulation because it's not triggering or causing the depolarization of our A deltas and our C fibers, right? The other thing that we know about high volt uh, is that it minim minimizes the chance of, of chemical and thermal effects. So in other words, it's not really going to cause any uh, polarity changes within the, the patient's um, skin or within, within their actual blood. Uh, and we know that it doesn't cause any thermal effects. Most modality, electrical modalities that we'll work with will not cause thermal effects. The only one that we haven't talked about yet is diathermy. That one certainly would cause a thermal effect. And then last but not least is my favorite component to high volt, which is this idea that because it's monophasic, we as clinicians can really truly determine the polarity of the treatment and that's going to be extremely important when we're talking about the physiological changes um, on the next few slides. So if you had to ask me of all of the four advantages, which one it to me is clinically significant and meaningful, it's this polarity. It's the first modality that we've talked about where we can talk about selecting a, a polarity, either positive and or negative, which can then cause physiological changes within our patients, right? So here's the bottom line. When we think about high volt um, and what is best used for, um, some would say muscle re-education. We'll talk about two other modalities that I think do a better job. Nerve stimulation. So in essence, let's say we have um, a surgery and you know how that surgeon um, will make an incision and you know how that incision site is extremely numb for an extended period of time. What we know about high volt is that it can be applied to the skin and it can stimulate the nerve fibers. Now, remember, it's all about that phase duration and being able to alter that, that phase duration, right? Two of the biggest components or uses for high volt would be the reduction of edema. So we have edema in a joint or um, we have a fusion in a joint, edema in a muscle, and we want to reduce that. So there's many clinical ways to do that. We can massage them. We can certainly elevate them. But one other way that has been reported um, to reduce edema is through the use of high volt. And we'll talk about settings. And then last but not least would be pain control. But if we go back to our TENS lecture where we talked about transcutaneous electrical neural nerve stimulation, we know that any modality is capable of reducing pain right through the actual gate theory. So that's not a surprise to us. So in terms of muscle re-education, we have to talk about a few things here. The first thing is the duty cycle. And remember the duty cycle refers to the amount of time the modality is on and the, mo the amount of time the modality is off. And in a very simplistic scenario, we'll say if the, mod if the modality or high volt is on for 10 seconds, then it will set that duty cycle to 50 seconds for its off time, right? So 10 seconds on, 50 seconds off. The ideal would be that that patient would be contracting when the electrical stimulation is actually on. In terms of polarity, you're not gonna set one because we don't care about polarity uh, physiologically when we're talking about um, improving muscular contactility, right? In terms of its pulse rate, wanna set the modality to at least 30 pulses per second, but the up to 60 would be good because it creates muscle tightening, right? If we want to increase muscular strength, if we want to re-educate a muscle that has atrophied, then we at least at minimum want our frequency of that treatment to be at 30 pulses per second, but the ideal would be upwards to 60 pulses per second because this is where we're going to cause muscle tetany, which means we're gonna have more muscular contraction, right? And we're going to be facilitating that contraction uh, of, of the patient as they're working through their contraction phase um, of this muscle re-education electrical stimulation treatment. 
So in terms of amplitude, how high should we crank up the stem, right? Well, if the goal is muscle re-education, which we just said it was, then we should at least crank the stem up, right? Think about this enough so that the patient can feel it, but so that we visibly see what? A muscle contraction, right? That would be motor level stimulation. We need to see the muscle contraction. So sometimes what I see with muscle re-education is that sometimes it's painful, right? Because we're still pushing that that intensity button. They're like, I can't feel it. Uh, oh, I feel it now, stop. But you don't see a contraction. So a lot of times with muscle re-education, we have to at least see the con visibly see the contraction with the electrical stimulation for it to be an effective muscle re-education electrical stimulation treatment, right? So keep that in mind as you're moving forward. In terms of pain uh, modulation, uh, we have high voltage that can be used for the gate control theory. Um, and some of these numbers are very similar to TINs and pre-mod and IFC. But in terms of mode, we want to create what's called a continuous mode if your device allows you to do that. If the pain is acute, so within 0 to 72 hours, then you want the polarity to be positive. If the pain is uh, chronic or lasting outside of that 72 hours and you want that polarity to be negative. So this is the first time where we're seeing, right, the polarity of a device um, coming into play and having a really good and positive physiological effect or impact on the patient. Uh, and then in terms of pulse rate, that's going to be similar to the other three modalities that we've talked about, but 60 to 100 pulses per second. And in terms of amplitude, we want that to be at sensory level. So the patient should at least feel the electrical stimulation, right, uh, as we're treating them. For opiate release, um, it's really going to depend. So mode-wise, we want it to be continuous. The only time we want it to be pulsed is if we're actually working on a trigger point, which is very rare. And in that case, you would actually need uh, what is called a probe or a point stimulator. So a very small device that sits on the actual muscle spasm and triggers it. Very similarly to our gait control, if it's acute pain, then we want that polarity to be positive. Uh, if, if it's um, chronic pain, then we want that polarity to be negative, right? And then last but not least, here's the major difference, right? The major difference is in the frequency of the treatment. So we're going to drop the frequency of the treatment to two to four pulses per second. Remember, that's going to stimulate our endogenous, endogenous opiates to be released so that we could have that sustained pain relief. And then in terms of amplitude, you want that motor response. So you want to at least see a visible muscle contraction in order to stimulate opiate release using high volt. Now that may be different for TENS and that may be different for IFC or pre-mod, but for a high volt, not only do we want to change the polarity, we also wanna make sure that we're seeing a visible muscle contraction, right? Okay, now the two uh, causes that I most often use high volt for in the clinical setting is for edema. So there are several different types of uses of high volt for edema. The first one is going to be um, edema formation. And then on the second slide, we'll talk about edema reduction. But let's start here first with edema formation. What we're saying is that we want to reduce the amount of edema in the area or prevent edema from forming is a better way to say it. We want to prevent edema from forming. So Let's take an ankle sprain patient. They sprain their ankle, they come into the clinic, and they aren't swollen yet. Our goal of this treatment is to reduce the amount of edema that forms after the injury. Does that make sense? So this is something that is preventative in nature. So if this is your goal, then we are going to do a continuous treatment, and we want the polarity to be negative. Now, so you're like, but why? Give me the why, Dr. Cosby. So what we know about the liquid and fluid that's associated with a positive, with a, um, what am I thinking, an acute edema is that the, the fluid and the viscosity of that is, is, is negatively charged. So when we set a polarity of negative, essentially think like charges do what? They repel. So what we're doing is kind of repelling any of those, um, any of that fluid that's sitting in the area out of the area, right? So we set it at a negative polarity and we want that pulse rate to be about 120, if not higher. In terms of amplitude, you want to do uh, sensory level uh, stimulation. So just enough for the patient to feel it. 
Now, um, I get a lot of questions usually in this class about um, the immersion technique, which is, okay, so can we actually do electrical stimulation in a whirlpool or in a, a, a cold bath? And the answer is yes, if the bath is plastic. So you certainly could be icing a patient, put the high volt on them, and they could be getting a stem treatment and an ice treatment all at the same time. Now, one of the things that I want to caution, if we are truly trying to prevent edema, you've got all of the settings here. It needs to be negative to repel anything out of the area. It has to be at least at 120 pulses per second for its frequency and should be at sensory level. Now, the hard part about high volt treatments is that they have to be done in 30 minute increments. And I know that's a long time for our patients to sit on a table, but if our goal is to truly prevent edema formation, right? then they have to be on this particular electrical stimulation for an extended period of time for it to actually exert physiological changes within the actual tissues, within the actual fluid, right? Within the injured area. And so the recommendation in the gold standard is this patient would do high, vol high voltage pulse stimulatory with negative polarity at 120 pulses per second, sensory amplitude at least four times a day for 30 minutes each treatment. And that seems like a lot, right, you guys? I mean, if we add that up, that's two hours of time. Now, should it be back to back? The answer is no. They'll need a break from the electrical stimulation. But we, if we want to prevent edema from forming, this is the standard and set protocol. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? I would say yes, because what we know about edema is it triggers the pain a spasm pain cycle. And when we trigger the pain spasm pain cycle, what happens guys? Lack of range of motion, lack of enthusiasm to complete the exercises, a slower return to play. So when you ask me, is it worth it? I say yes, but you'll have to ask yourself that question as you move into being an autonomous clinician. The other form of treatment that we see high volt being used for is edema reduction. So this is when a patient comes in, they're already swollen and now we want to reduce edema, right? Completely different than what we were just talking about on the other slide, which was preventative in nature. Here, we're talking about the typical patient that comes into us, right? And already has swelling. So most often the mode is going to be continuous. And then what they say um, is to actually alternate the current or the polarity. So you're, on your device, you should be able to select like there's this thing called positive and negative. So part of the treatment, they'll, uh, a positive polarity will be delivered. And then during the other half of the treatment, a negative polarity will, will, be, um, will be delivered, right? Uh, and in terms of pulse rate, it's going to be quite the opposite of your prevention um, of, of edema. So in this case, when we're trying to reduce it, we want to lower the frequency. And by low, you're looking at about two to four pulses per second. Uh, and then in terms of the amplitude, you want it to be strong, but comfy. So you don't want it to be so strong that they're, they're in pain, right? We can look at motor level edema reduction and we can say, oh, well, this looks familiar opiate release. So yes, we're going to get some opiate release for sure. Um, and then in terms of electrode setup, what would you guys do? Quadrupolar, bipolar, cross setup. What do you think? Great. What I'm hoping you guys said is that these have to be, are you ready for this? Bipolar setups. We do not cross these electrodes. And the reason we don't is if we cross them, guess where we're going to push that swelling? Right into the center of that X. So we actually want these to be bipolar setups that are located both distal and proximal to the actual swelling site or the, the site of edema. Okay, you guys? All right, in terms of wound healing, we have a better modality for this, but for now, um, high volt has been reported to aid in wound healing. What we know is that if there's if we place select a positive polarity, what we've seen in the research literature is that with high volt in particular on a positive polarity, there's the promotion of granulation tissue. So essentially what we see is that that granulation tissue starts to lay down, right? And we've talked about that in the proliferation and repair phase, right? Where we have that granular tissue starting to lay down. You get, it, it stimulates clot formation and margination, which means it's going to kind of isolate the injury, which is all things that we want. On the negative polarity side, we see an increase in inflammatory byproducts. 
Um, but this is a good thing, especially when we have that necrotic tissue or the tissue that started to die off because it's going to kind of stimulate some of those white blood cells to come in, the histamine to cause vasodilation, which means more white blood cells, more phagocytosis. So most often probably don't want to do a negative polarity in the acute phase, right? Because we don't want to increase the inflammatory byproducts that early on. But certainly in the proliferation, in the maturation phase where you might need more white blood cells to come in there um, and start that, that process of phagocytosis. So treatment regimen. For a negative polarity treatment, you want to treat for about 20 minutes um, for a positive polarity treatment because you're stimulating uh, the release of that granulation tissue, then you want a longer treatment to do that. So you want that to be about 40 minutes. Now, you guys notice I haven't said anything about frequency, right? Uh, that's been intentional. The reality is there isn't much out there to suggest what the frequency of the treatment would be. So then I, I, I'll pulls it back to you and I'll say it this way. Your frequency of treatment really should be based on um, your pain theories. So if I want to have a gating theory, then I'm gonna go higher frequency with the positive polarity, right? Um, and then if I want to maybe get some opiate release in there, then I'll do the, the, the lower frequency treatment. Okay, guys, uh, I think that's it. That's the end of high voltage. I hope what you've learned from this uh, essentially is that you have different modalities that are out there that are capable of doing some really amazing things within our patients, right? We talked about wound healing today. And by wound healing, let me clarify what I mean is like your turf burns, right? Where you need that wound to heal so it doesn't get infected. If any of you are going into physical therapy or PA, uh, physician assistant school at some point in time, be thinking about your older patients who, who get those bed sores because they've been laying so long. We know is you can put um, high voltage around that wound and you can trigger um, or stimulate some improvement within that wound, wound area. Um, so this is just another modality that you have. But by far, you guys, the reason that I use high voltage electrical stimulation is for edema reduction, edema that's already there, and edema prevention, trying to prevent a mass amount of, of edema. But again, you have to be extremely aggressive with what you're doing and how you're using um, high voltage if you're going to use it, right? Remember, we're going to have to treat that, patient's, that patient at least four times a day uh, after that initial injury. So I hope this has been helpful uh, I hope that you learned, if nothing else, at least another modality to add to your toolbox. Looking forward to the next online lecture.